Hi, everybody. Uh, today, what we're going to jump into is a topic that can be a little complex. And so what I'm going to ask you as you begin to work your way through this lesson is to not be overly concerned if you have some confusion in the short run. So if as I'm talking about some stuff and as you're seeing some stuff on your screen, it doesn't automatically come into you, like then feel free, pause the video, work your way back. But if there's still kind of this lingering confusion or a lingering doubt where you say, I don't have this idea automatically, I'm going to say just, just hang tight and proceed. And as we get into the practice of working with some of this stuff, I think we're going to see our understanding expand. So, as I said, it is a big topic for today. In order to discuss that, we're going to go back and we're going to talk about a function that you have some background with from your grade 11 year. And you can see a picture of that function on your screen. There is our good old hyperbola. And so, this would have been a function that you would have been responsible for in years past. Okay, you can see the question that I've posed to you in the top right corner. Where do vertical asymptotes occur? And so what I want you to do is I want you to pause the video and just ponder that question a little bit. Where do vertical asymptotes occur? Okay, pause the video now. Okay, so we should be back. And I'm hoping that we've got kind of at least an answer to that question. Where do vertical asymptotes occur? In fact, you can even see it labeled on your graph. That we can see that we have a vertical asymptote that is at x equals 0. So there is our line that our curve is going to approach but not touch. And now, maybe the more important question. So now I want to come to... Why do vertical asymptotes occur? This one's going to take a little bit more thought, I think. So, same thing as before. I want you to pause the video and ponder. Try to come up with a reason for why that vertical asymptote of x equals 0 occurs for that curve. Okay, pause the video now. Okay, and we're back. And so I think we are doing an outstanding job if we answered that y by looking at the equation to that function. And if there was any part of us that said, well, if I have the equation 1 over x, then the reason why x equals 0 represents an asymptote, a vertical asymptote, is because if I sub in x equals 0, then I'm going to get y equals 1 over 0, and I can't calculate that because that makes that undefined. If that's the case, then I think we have a great understanding of why that vertical asymptote exists. I don't think it's going to be that easy as we go, but I think that that's a good start. X can't equal zero because my denominator can't equal zero. Let's take that understanding and now let's try to expand on that a little bit. We're going to take what we have from our past and we're going to really stretch it. Okay, here we go. What you see on your screen right now then is one problem. And what I want you to do is I want you to find all the vertical asymptotes for that function. Okay, so I want to pause it and I want you guys to work your way through. Okay, pause it now. Okay, and we're back. And so, as we take a look at that, we may have a quick instinct that says, I'm looking at that denominator. Because the previous problem, it's where my denominator equaled zero, so I'm going to take that denominator and examine, well, when does x plus one equal zero? And we notice, probably even through inspection, that that value is x equals negative 1. And so we may end up having a first instinct that says, at x equals negative 1, we will have a vertical asymptote. I want us to take that blue and maybe backtrack a little bit. And what I mean by that is, I want you to imagine that I gave you this question and not with a find all vertical asymptotes for, because 
We didn't have any understanding of that, what that was at the beginning of last year. But instead, if I said I got rid of that y equals, and I just gave you the fraction, no instruction, just the fraction, then do you start to have an instinct of what you might want to do with that? I'm hoping that our instinct may have been to try to simplify that fraction. And so if it was then, well then we could take a look at the top and we notice that our top factors, and because it factors into x plus two times x plus one, then we can divide out common factors and we can shrink that down to an x plus two. Nice. Now, a couple things that I want to go through, and I'm not saying that we're done what we did in the red, but a couple things that I want to address that are maybe going to pull back the curtain a little bit and allow us to see a greater perspective on what we already knew. I am going to go through and I'm going to produce a quick picture because we could draw a quick picture of that function. So what that says is the original white function is equal to the red one. That's why that line starts off with an equals, which is equal to that red one. And so if I was to go through and ask you to sketch that function, the original one, then since they're all equal, you should be able to sketch the last one. And we should all know what a function y equals x plus 2 looks like. So we have a y-intercept at like 2. We have a slope of 1, so I have my perfect 45-degree angle or line. And I can go ahead and construct that line. And there we go. Now, a couple things arise. First off, that red line is not the line of the original function. And maybe worth considering one of those things that we had to deal with last year. And perhaps you even remembered that you weren't finished getting down to x plus 2 because that actually wasn't the value of the function. The value of the function is equal to x plus 2 as long as we state our restriction on that expression. And maybe you just viewed a restriction last year as the sort of thing like, oh, okay, my teacher makes me add that on all the time. But I'm hoping that we understand that that restriction is what allows us to say that the original expression is the same thing as the final expression. They are equal for every x value except x equals negative 1. So what does that mean for my sketch? Well, it means that my sketch, x plus 2, is the original function, just as long as x does not equal negative 1. And so what occurs then at an x value of negative 1? Well, that means, and I'm just going to take my little eraser, that if I was to go through, like, it doesn't exist at like a little point there where x equals negative 1. Now, that's a really confusing graph because, like, does it exist at negative 1.1 or negative 0 0.9? Yeah. And so maybe we realize how we can show everything up to a value but not including that value. And if we can remember that a little bit, then what that means is we actually have an open circle. Now, that open circle actually has a name to it. And what that is, is called a gap. Now, that red line is the original function because it's equal to y equals x plus 2 as long as x does not equal negative 1. Now, there's two things that I want to address in this case. The first one is, well, we recognize that we have a gap. 
And you could actually find the location of that gap because you could sub that x value that is your restriction back into my final simplified form. So back into x plus 2. And when I calculate that then, I get a value for 1, which tells me that my gap is at an x value of negative 1 and a y value of 1. Like I could actually label on the coordinates of that gap. The second thing that I want us to get to is I think that that just challenged our definition of why vertical asymptotes occur and where. Notice back up here in blue that based on what we discussed in the previous screen, when we looked at that graph, it's what made my denominator equal to zero, what gives me a divide by zero and therefore undefined. And pretty quickly we can see that, well, x equals negative 1 makes my original function undefined, but it did not produce an asymptote. So I want to take that good thought, that good piece of theory about having that divide by zero, having the undefined to create an asymptote, and I just want to clarify a little bit of it. So what you see on your screen now, there's your important theory. And so I just want to draw a little bit of distinction between what we discussed earlier and what you now see on your screen. What was different between 1 over x and the uglier fraction I gave you afterwards? x squared plus 3x plus 2 all over x plus 1. One of those fractions was fully simplified. The other one was not. We saw that that problem in problem 1 was not fully simplified because we could factor and reduce. So the biggest part at the beginning of this is about a fully simplified function. So let's make sure that we have our theory. A vertical asymptote, and we'll just call that asymptote like x equals c. We know that all vertical lines are x equals a constant, so I'll just call it x equals c. They exist when? Number one, and this is a hierarchy, number one. A fully simplified function, and let's just call it f of x to give, us a, give it a name, is a rational function. And so what do we mean when we say a rational function? We mean it's a fraction. More importantly, when we define a rational function, we mean that it's a fraction with variables on the bottom. Number two, that f of c is undefined. Now, let's make sure that we're good on that notation. Look back up in the original again, just to make sure that we're good. That original line on this screen. A vertical asymptote, x equals c, exists. So, that tells you, when I sub c into f, it becomes undefined. And specifically, how is it undefined? It's undefined by a divide by zero. Okay, I want to make sure that we don't just say, oh, well, if it's undefined, then we're good. Keep in mind that you graphed or sketched a lot of functions last year that could have been undefined, but they didn't lead to asymptotes. One quick example, if I can just jot it down on the side, is you got very used to sketching your square root function. Well, your square root function looks like that. If I sub any negative underneath that root, then I get an undefined value. But that doesn't mean that there's a vertical asymptote. So we have to make sure that we understand that the reason why the undefined occurs is because of divide by zero. The divide by zero in a fully simplified function creates our vertical asymptote. You'll also see in the star there, there's a little conclusion that we can draw from what we just encountered in that previous problem. So you see the little star there. If the factor x minus a divides out, which is what we saw in the previous problem, your factor of x plus 1 divided out, then there's a gap 
at x equals a. And you can find the coordinates of that point by subbing your a back into the function, and so you get something very generic like a comma f of a. There is your x value and your y value. And there we go. Okay, there is our theory. We've got a little bit more theory to talk about, and then we're going to jump into actually dealing with some of these asymptotes. So, a little bit of lingo. So, what you see on your screen right now is just a topic, and it's a term, nature of the curve. And we've actually examined a little bit of a nature of the curve in another situation. But in this situation, what we refer to as nature of the curve you'll see it in blue, is the behavior of the curve as it approaches an asymptote. It's basically like a formal way to say, like when we talk about the nature of something, we're talking about how does the curve curve? Like what does it do? What is the curve doing? And in this case, as we approach an asymptote. So since we are talking about a vertical asymptote, then really what we're trying to answer is the question you see in red. Does the curve increase or decrease towards the asymptote? That's really the question we're talking about. Does the curve increase or decrease towards the asymptote? So let's jump in and examine a little bit of the nature of the curve on our basic hyperbola, y equals 1 over x. So to take a look back at what that original curve looks like, you see that on your screen right now. For us to examine the nature of the curve, we're trying to ask ourselves, what is the curve doing as it approaches x equals 0? And so you'll notice that that red question we had on the previous screen, does the curve increase or decrease as we approach? You'll kind of see as we come this way, our curve seems to be going up. And as we come this way, our curve seems to be going down. So we can see that a curve could go in two different directions as it approached an asymptote. Okay, what I want to do is I want to zero in on part of that curve. And just to simplify some things, we're going to zero in to the first quadrant. And so what you can see then, there's the first quadrant a little zoomed in. We can see our red curve, and we can see our blue asymptote at x equals 0. What I want to do is I want to examine a little bit of a table of values. And this is going to be a bit of a tedious process, but I'm going to ask that you just kind of hang tight a little bit on this one. In order for us to examine nature of the curve, we're going to go back to how we generate points. And that's why you see table of values up at the top. So I'm going to construct my good old table of values. There's an x value and a y value. And what we can do is we can start to sub in x values that get closer and closer and closer to our asymptote. And so maybe, you know, like I sub in 1. Now, I'm subbing that into the equation of my curve, 1 over x, and so I have my 1 over 1, and it spits out a y value of 1. Well, 1, 1 might exist here. And that's not very close to my asymptote. So I'm going to start to approach that asymptote and just get a little bit closer. Like maybe I examine, okay, well, what's my curve doing at 1 half? And so I sub 1 half into my table for my x. Okay, well then that's going to give me 1 divided by 1 half, which we should pretty quickly come in at 2. And so at an x value of 1 half, I now have a y value of 2. And so we have a point somewhat like that. Well, an x value of 1 half isn't very close to x equals 0. And so we're going to zoom in, and we're going to keep getting closer and closer and closer. So maybe I sub in, like, one-fifth. And from what we saw on the right, we should pretty quickly get to a y value of 5. So now I'm starting to get, like, way up here. 
The problem, though, is an x value of one-fifth isn't very close. And so I keep going through that process of getting closer and closer. So like maybe one-tenth, I'd see I get 10. If I stretch out that table a little farther, further, then I can go through and say, well, what if I sub in like one one-hundredth? Like that's a really small x value. Well, we get a y value of 100. And I'm going to argue to you, that's not very close. Because we could zoom in even closer. And so we keep subbing in these smaller and smaller values. Values of x that keep getting closer and closer and closer to zero. And so maybe I end up getting like 1 over 1 million. Like I'm imagining an x value of 1 millionth. Well, then that gives us a y value of a million. And all of a sudden, you know, we're at the sky. Our curve is taking off huge in that positive direction. And we can see it in our table of values. Our problem becomes, though, one one millionth isn't very close. Because if I really zoomed in, I could still have a pretty decent distance away from x equals zero. The only value I know I cannot sub in is x equals 0, because if I subbed in x equals 0, then I get undefined. So I can't sub in that x value of 0. But I could repeatedly keep subbing in smaller and smaller values of x. I could keep going on that till the end of time. And if I continue to do my table of values following in that direction, then I'm going to see a trend in the y values. And that trend is what we refer to as the nature of the curve. So how do we try or how do we express that idea in mathematical notation? Okay, we're going to introduce something to you. It's going to be a new notation. I don't want you to get really confused by it. We're going to slow walk it through, and then I'll explain why we use it. What we're going to do is we're going to introduce the concept of a limit. And a limit has a notation to it. But it's important for us to note what a limit is. A limit acts as infinitely many substitutions. And so by using the notation that refers to a limit, what that actually removes or acts like is like we've done infinitely many substitutions into a table of values. Like that process that we just went through. We keep going on till the end of time. And it allows us to go straight to a value of a function. So let's introduce the notation and we'll be good. Okay. My limit notation has three letters. It is L, I, and M. Every limit that we examine requires a function. And so we include the function in our limit. Now I want you to notice that L, I, M is written on the same line as F of X. Okay, they're straight across from each other. Every limit requires a function. Well, you guys noticed that in that last case, we need some direction. Like, what are you going to keep doing with your x values in your table of values? And so what we need to also include then is x has to approach a value. And I'm just going to put in a, some generic constant. There is your limit notation. And that's what represents infinitely many substitutions. Now, the one other thing that I want you to get down is that this arrow, when you see the X with an arrow to the A, that arrow refers to approaches. And approaches is a mathematical concept. That means that we are going to get so close to A, we can treat it like it's A, as long as we know it's not A. 
And I know that that starts to sound like a rhyme a little bit, and it is a bit of a rhyme. Approaches means so close to it, you can treat it like it is as long as you know it's not. And I know that that gets a little confusing, and that's where I say, let's be patient with it. In that last example, we subbed in values that were getting so close to zero, we could act as if it was zero, as long as we knew it was never zero. We're going to see that over and over again, and as we continue to see it, I think we're going to have a greater understanding. So, look at that function notation. That's what I want to use. And I want to show you the way that maybe we're told to go through this with you so that you can understand why we want to introduce this limit notation now. And so, what you see on the screen now is that old table of values problem we just walked through. And I want to show you a way that we've been recommended to go through this with you. And just so you can see my problem with it. You can see at times, if you were to look in some textbooks or look online, that there would be a number of explanations that would ask you to go through that process that you see in gold with the table of values and examine the nature of the curve in this way. That what you have is 1 over a small number. I hope we get that that's what's happening in our table of values. We have 1 over a small number. Well, what happens as we continue to work our way through that table? Well, then we get 1 over a very small number. Okay, so, well, what happens if we take 1 divided by a small number? We get a large number. And what happens if we take 1 divided by a very small number? Then we get a very large number. And you can see what's happening to your curve as we approach x equals 0. That as my x value gets smaller and smaller, my y value gets bigger and bigger, and that's why my curve takes off in that positive direction. But I can't, in good conscience, have you write that as your solution. Like, really? Like, that's what you're going to include. 1 over small number equals 1 over very small number equals large number equals very large number? I can't. I can only imagine what that would look like when you were sitting in your math class next year at university. So, how can we address this with some notation? I want us to go through that notation. So you guys can express this idea properly. But it's going to require one extra addition. So, as you take a look at the screen right now, you'll notice that I've put two headings up. That we're going to address a left side limit and we're going to address a right side limit. I have to examine both limits because if you remember on our hyperbola, my curve did different things as I approached my asymptote. Okay, so we're going to jump in and we're going to examine our left side limit. So. That means I have LIM, my function has an equation or an expression of 1 over x, and my asymptote exists at x approaches 0. So what I'm going to examine is the limit of 1 over x as x approaches 0. Well, now on the right side, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to examine the same curve as x approaches 0. Now, a couple things in notation. Make sure that your x approaches 0 is entirely underneath your limit. Don't write stuff like this where your x approaches 0 is coming way out from underneath your limit. Okay, you take a look at both my left side and my right side limit, and I hope you can see that 
those notations look exactly the same. So we have a problem. How can you distinguish between a left side limit and a right side limit? Well, the way that we distinguish is that we have to denote the left side. And so if I think about my number line with zero being in the middle, then all the numbers that are to the left of zero are all your negatives, and all the numbers to the right of zero are your positives. We use that same notation to denote left side and right side. What you'll see then is if we want to approach from the left, we put what looks like a little exponent on your zero. That exponent is simply going to be a negative sign. What that instruction actually says now is examine the curve 1 over x as x approaches 0 from the left. And then we do the same thing with our right. My guess would be you could probably guess how we would denote that. There's your little exponent with a positive sign. Okay, there is my left side and my right side limit. What we're going to do now is we're going to actually go through and evaluate each one of those limits. So for simplicity's sake, let's start out on our right side limit. So what that says is we are going to examine how we approach the curve 1 over x if our x value approaches 0 from the right. So this is what we did in our table of values. We subbed in a one-half, we subbed in a one-fifth, we subbed in a one-tenth, we subbed in a one with that, and so on and so on and so on. Except now, we don't have to do infinitely many substitutions to be able to talk about what the nature of the curve is. Instead, we can simply go through and say, well, let's examine the trend in the value. So, here's how we begin. We need to treat the x value so close to 0 that we can treat it like it's 0. And so what that means then is we sub in 0. There's the first part. So close to 0, you can treat it like it's 0. But now we need to bring back in the second part. As long as we know it's not 0. And so what we see in our limit is we're going to get so close to zero, but we're never going to touch it. If it was equal to zero, then we would actually write x equals zero. And instead, you have that arrow for approach. So what I have in green, then, would be if that x value equaled zero. Well, now we need to make sure that we mark it that it doesn't equal zero that what it's really going to become are very small positive values. So how do we denote that? You actually see it in your notation. That zero positive means to the right of zero. Now, I know it sounds really weird to hear zero positive because when you guys were young, you were told, like, there's no such thing as a positive or a negative zero. And I do want to clarify the difference between negative zero or positive zero versus zero positive or zero negative. And I know that that's going to be a little confusing in the short run, but we'll get there. So what I have in green then is going to be what I need to evaluate. And what that says is take one and divide it by. And the way we have to interpret is that zero positive is that is a really small number that is always getting smaller. Like, I want you to pause the video now if you need to get that down in your notes. But what that zero positive means is a really small number that is always getting smaller. So, I'm going to go back to that little blue statement that I was kind of making fun of a little bit. The 1 divided by small, 1 divided by really small. We just think about that theory. And so, if I have 1 divided by a really small number, then it's going to become a big number. 
And if that small number keeps getting smaller, then 1 divided by a number that keeps getting smaller is going to keep getting bigger. And it will always keep getting bigger. Well, how do you say keeps getting bigger and never stops? There's your infinity. Make sure that we are good that what infinity refers to is without bound. That's what that means. Specifically, that it increases without bound. And so what we have in green then would be a full solution. That as you guys take a look at that green, that says that as my, sorry, take a look at the red. As my graph approaches zero from the right, my curve's value goes to infinity. So if I was to put on a quick sketch of that graph again, we saw that our hyperbola did something like this. And as I approach x equals 0 from the right, so I'm actually moving left. As I approach from the right, you notice that your curve value increases. So the other nice thing that we can see now when we see that on our graph is we need to remember that every limit is going to represent a y value. And so what that says on that right side limit is as I approach 0 from the right side, the value of my function or the y values increase without bound. And there we go. So I'm going to erase some things on the screen. If you just showed me the red limit and the green solution, you are perfect. We don't have a need to write down 1 over small equals 1 over very small equals very large, large equals very large equals infinity. You guys can use the concept of a limit to speak about it in proper terms. Okay, let's jump in and let's play around with the left side limit. Now, I want to deal with this one a little bit backwards. So I'm going to put back on the picture of our graph because we haven't really looked at that left side closely. x equals 0 was your asymptote. If we approach from the left side, that means we're actually moving right. We are approaching from the left. And so what happens to the value of the curve in this case? We should see that it goes forever down. Well, how do you say increase without bound? It's infinity. But how do you say going down? That would be our negative infinity. Notice that the y values for that graph keep becoming bigger and bigger and bigger negatives. Okay, we can see it on the picture. Let's see it in our notation now. So I'm going to jump back up and we're going to address our limit. Okay. The limit of 1 over x as x approaches 0 from the left. So it's x is approaching 0. So x is going to get so close to 0, I can treat it like it's 0. So sub in 0. Now I come to the second part as long as I know it's not 0. So what am I really subbing in then? Well, my limit notation tells me that I'm subbing in values just to the left of 0. OK. Now my notation matches up. I'm subbing in values a little bit to the left of 0. Okay, well, now I can calculate that because I know what that zero negative means. That means getting smaller, a really small number that is always getting smaller. So if I was to take 1 and divide it by that really small number that is always getting smaller, then I get a bigger number that continues to get bigger. There's my infinity. However... 
I notice that on the top of that fraction, I have a positive 1. And I notice on the bottom of the fraction, I have values that are to the left of 0. And so if I have values that are to the left of 0, then those are negative numbers. Well, if I was to take a positive and divide it by a negative, then I know my outcome will always be negative. And there you go. There is a left side and a right side limit to have us discuss the nature of a curve in proper terms. Okay, this is where I said, if we're still a little iffy on it, we're a little unsure and I'm kind of confused in the notation, I think as we get more practice with it, we're going to get more and more comfortable. So what I want to do is I want to kind of jump in a little bit and start to play with some of that practice. So let's take a look at the problem on the screen. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through, and if you read that question carefully, you'll notice that what I'm talking about is making a partial sketch. Like that is, we don't really have all the tools at our disposal yet to be able to sketch this one really accurately. We had pretty good tools, but not everything. So what we're going to do is we're going to use our intercepts and our vertical asymptotes to make a really good sketch for that function. This is going to require a ton of work. And so since this, the, this is the first one that we're going to go through as a group, then I want to maybe lead you on this one a little bit. We're going to find a number of things. Like you're going to do like a page worth of work to create a sketch in like the bottom corner of your page. Okay, we're going to do a lot of mechanics on this. And because we're going to use a lot of mechanics, then I think it's really important for us to put down some little headings every once in a while. So let's say that I was to walk through this problem with you. What would I go through and do first? Well, the first thing I always look at is my function fully simplified. And so it is worth going through and saying, well, I can factor the top and I can factor the bottom. And after I factor that, I notice that I can reduce that function. That would always be my first action. Can I simplify what's in front of me? Now, the other thing that comes from that, if it does simplify further, is we just found out that we have a gap at x equals 1. So that's a piece of information I'm going to kind of like set aside for a second. Or at the very least, we could also then go, well, I could also sub my x equals 1 into my simplified form to calculate the function value there. And so when I do that, my x value becomes 1, my y value becomes negative 2 over 2, so that's a negative 1. So I just found out that I have a gap at x equals 1, and the specific point where that gap exists is at 1, negative 1. Okay. I still haven't done anything that the problem asked, because it said using intercepts and vertical asymptotes. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to jump in, and I'm going to find my intercepts. I imagine for a lot of us, finding intercepts should be pretty easy. So to find my y-intercept, then my x value equals 0. And I'm going to sub that into my simplified form. So when I do, then I'm going to end up getting a y value of negative 3 over 1, which is negative 3. Then I can go ahead and I can find my x-intercept by setting y equal to 0. And I would hope that we come in on this line. Now, it's weird at times, I'm just going to hop off onto the side, that some of us come to that line because we had this fraction. And we may have said to ourselves, oh, well, I can just like get rid of my divide by, so I multiply it out. And I would not think of it that way. Rather, let's rely on some of that information, that theory that we already have. How do I make a fraction value equal to zero? Well my top has to equal 0. And so what you'll notice in blue is I set my top to equal 0. 
And now I can solve for that. Okay. What I found then is my graph has a y-intercept at negative 3 and it has an x-intercept at 3. Now we're going to jump in and we're going to deal with our vertical asymptotes. And so what you see in the top left of your screen is that's just our simplified form for that function. What I would do is I would put down another little heading. And so I'm going to put down a little heading, just VA vertical asymptotes. Well, we should be able to read from the green where my vertical asymptote exists. Because I can see that fraction is fully simplified, and so whatever value makes my denominator equal to zero is the existence of my asymptote. So let's make sure, though, that we don't say, hey, my vertical asymptote is 1 or negative 1. Keep in mind that what we're talking about is the equation of a line. So we have our vertical asymptote at x equals negative 1. You can simply state it. And now what we need to do is to examine the nature of the curve. So I need to deal with how I approach negative 1 for the function x minus 3 times x plus 1. One recommendation I would make for you is always write your left side limit on the left and then write your right side limit on the right. It's just so that then when you go to take this information and transfer it onto a graph, we're not having to flip across and put the left side on the right side and the right side on the left. It, it can get confusing. So for us to go through, my left side limit is on the left and my right side limit is on the right. Okay, let's walk through that left side limit now. So I see the equation of my function and my limit says... Make your x value approach negative 1 from the left. So our x value is going to get so close to negative 1, we can treat it like it's negative 1. So we sub in negative 1. Okay, well, if I sub in negative 1 on top, I get negative 4. And if I sub in negative 1 on the bottom, I get my 0. Keep in mind that every time I make my substitution into the denominator... I should get 0, because the whole reason I chose that value is what made the bottom 0 to make my fraction undefined. So if I ever make that substitution in on the denominator and I don't get 0, I know I goofed up somewhere. Okay, so there was so close to negative 1, we could treat it like it was negative 1. But now we have to remember it's not really negative 1. It's a little bit to the left of negative 1. Now, there are people who will go through, and on their number line, they're going to think in their head that like a number to the left of negative 1 might be like negative 1.1. And I'm going to argue to you, that's fine to think of, but I think there's a better way that to say any numbers to the left of negative 1 are bigger negatives. And if we just think about bigger negatives, then you're going to find that you get to calculate less. Okay. So now the second part for us to go through is we need to realize that we didn't really sub in negative 1. We subbed in bigger negatives than negative 1. Well, this is kind of the next approach then. That really what we have then is not negative 4 on your top. We really have a bigger negative than that negative 4. And that I find sometimes students like to put a directional symbol on numbers that aren't zeros. My recommendation to you is don't do that. It really gets confusing when you start to go through and you see all these directional symbols everywhere that it's a really important process for us to understand that we really don't care about that directional symbol in negative 4. Like, I want you to think about it this way. Like, on your number line, if there was negative 4, and say you went calculated, and you got an answer of, like, negative 4.001, or you got an answer of, like, 
negative 3.999. Wouldn't you just round both of those answers or want to round both of those answers off to negative four? Like you just want to come to there. That directional symbol on my negative four doesn't really matter that much. However, when you look on a number line, if I am a little bit to the right of zero, then I'm like 0 0.001. But if I'm a little bit to the left of zero, I am negative 0 0.001. The sign of my value completely changes. And so whether I'm on one side of zero or the other side of zero, that matters a lot. Whether I'm on one side of negative four or the other side of negative four, eh, who cares really? So when you look back up into that limit, I don't care about my directional symbol on that negative four, but I do care about it on my zero. So now when I look into my denominator, my x plus one, and I imagine subbing in a value a little bit to the left of negative one, then I'm going to sub in bigger negatives. And so if I take a big negative and I add one to it, then that adding one won't be enough to take that big negative and turn it positive. My denominator will always be negative. And so I put on my little directional symbol on zero. Now that we have it to that point, we should be pretty good. Deal with your signs, deal with your concept. So I have a negative divided by a negative, which is a positive, of which we won't write that. And then I have four divided by a really small number that's always getting smaller, means I get a big number that's always getting bigger. I have infinity. Now, okay, let's try our right side limit now. So we're gonna go a little faster. Now I'm imagining I'm subbing in negative one, but on the right of it. So I start off so close to negative one, I sub in negative one. And now I have to remember I'm not really subbing in negative one, I'm subbing in a little bit to the right of negative one. Well, numbers on my number line that are a little bit to the right of negative one are smaller negatives. It would be like negative 0 0.9. So when I look at that denominator where my zero is, I'm really taking a smaller negative and then adding one to it. Well, if I have a small negative and I add one to it, then that positive one is gonna be enough to change it to a positive value. And so I can go through now and evaluate. Well, I have a negative divided by a positive, which is a negative. And now I have my four divided by a really small number that's always getting smaller, it means I get a really big number that's always getting bigger. And there we go. So there is all of my stuff, all of my work to be able to go through and produce a sketch. The job now is to take what we've got and try to produce a picture with it. So here we go. Okay, so hopefully you can see, I just made a little bit of a list of everything that we found up to this point down the left side. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on a quick set of axes, and we're going to build our graph based on what we've found. So I've got my y-axis, I have my x-axis, yikes, that was really bad. This is difficult to do on an iPad. I'm sure there's an easier way, but there we go. So now what I would recommend to you is put on your intercepts for, or sorry, your asymptotes first. I know it's probably what we are like least comfortable with, but we did know that we had our asymptote at x equals negative one. And so, by putting on that vertical asymptote, and maybe I just estimate that that would be like a negative one value on my x-axis, that that's going to act like a wall. 
And so I know that my curve's not going to be able to cross that asymptote. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on the nature of my curve. So if you take a look at what I just boxed in in gold, that says the limit as x approaches negative 1 for my function goes to infinity. How am I approaching negative 1? From the left. And so, as I approach that asymptote at x equals negative 1, from the left, my curve must increase. And so I'm going to put like a little arrow there to show that, okay, my curve has to be going in that direction. I examine the other side, and I'm just going to get rid of some of that. As I take a look at that next limit, as I approach negative 1 from the right, my curve goes to negative infinity. So as I approach from the right, my curve must go down. There, that gives me an idea about direction of my curve. Okay. So now we start to work our way through, and now I might start to say, okay, let's deal with some, some intercepts. I know that my graph is going to have an x-intercept at 3. It's going to have a y-intercept at negative 3. And I think that we could now piece together a little bit how that curve has to go. So we should be okay to say then that my curve, it has to go down in this direction, but then also pass through this point, pass through this point. Like it's going to do something like that. We just don't know what it does over in this area. Like how high does that curve go? We do know for certain though that that curve is not going to cross back over. Yikes, I'm still on a highlighter. But you can still see it because we would have found another intercept. We just don't know how high that curve goes. So that's what I was mentioning at the very beginning about saying, like, we're making a partial sketch. Okay, well, on the left side, we can use that same reasoning then, that our curve has to take off in that direction. But I know it can't hit the x-axis, so it's got to level off somehow over there. And there's a pretty decent partial sketch. And there we go. Hopefully not too bad. You got to see some limits at work, so hopefully not that painful. Okay, I'm going to throw up one other problem. Here we go. So take a look at your screen now, and I've given you a big, ugly function. And what I want you to do is to be able to go through and find all the asymptotes for that curve. And once we do, then we're going to make a partial sketch again. So first thing we look to do is to see if we can simplify that. And at the very least, we can see that that function is fully simplified. Like the only way I could reduce that fraction would be to divide out a common factor. And since on top I have an x squared, I don't have a common factor of x on the bottom. So that is fully simplified. Okay, so the next thing I'm going on the hunt for, I'm looking for my vertical asymptotes. That's what the problem says. Find all vertical asymptotes. So as I go through to find those vertical asymptotes, I need to see what makes my denominator equal to zero. So in that whole fraction, all I really care about is this. And therefore, I'm going to go on the hunt just for that bottom. So, to find my vertical asymptotes, I am going to set my bottom, that's a cubed, equal to zero, and then solve. So, I have four terms. I really like the look of it because I can common factor out an x squared from the first, a negative four from the end, and pretty quickly I see that that cubic is going to factor by grouping. So in this instance then, I could get to this line, and some people would really like to put this line down. 
It's not needed for the vertical asymptotes, but it may make things a little easier for me because I could actually collect my x minus 2s. We still see anyway that I have at x equals 2 or negative 2, those end up being my x values that make my bottom 0. Now, in terms of how would you express that? For us to solve an equation, we would then normally just say, well, x equals plus or minus 2. The problem becomes you're actually writing vertical asymptotes. And so since each of them represent lines, they actually represent different lines. So make sure that you would then state that we have an x equals negative 2 vertical asymptote and an x equals 2 vertical asymptote. There's no such thing as x equals plus or minus 2 vertical asymptote. Okay, now that we have those as our vertical asymptotes, it's time to find our nature. And so for that, we're going to jump in and we're going to play around with some limits. Okay, here we go. So what you'll see up on the top of your screen as our two versions of what we could go through and use for that f of x function. Now, one of the things that I want to make sure we're good with is clearly you can use either version to test your limit. However, because what we're examining is what makes the denominator zero, and then on either side of it, a lot of people tend to like the blue to be able to evaluate the limit, the factored form of that denominator, because then you can just deal with your signs. If you ended up dealing with the original in the green, well, now as you go through, you're going to have to calculate a bunch of stuff on the bottom. So my recommendation to you is, if you've done all that work to factor the denominator, use the factored form, especially if you're pretty confident with it. So we're going to jump in and we're going to deal with our limits. What I'm going to address first is my vertical asymptote at x equals negative 2. I'm going to deal with the most left asymptote at the beginning. And then just like before, I can work my way left to right, and then I can transfer all my information to my graph. Okay, well, I'm going to deal with my left side for that function. And it's a pretty big equation to lump in there. Okay, now to evaluate that limit, I need to imagine that x is so close to negative 2, I can treat it like it's negative 2. So I'm going to sub in negative 2. And you'll notice that I made the substitution into my brackets and then simplified anything that was easy. Now, I still have further simplifying I can do. So x is so close to negative 2, I treat it like it's negative 2. Well, on my denominator, 16 times 0 is 0. So there is all my work where it was so close to negative 2, I treated it like it was negative 2. And now I have to go back and remember it's not really negative 2. So since I'm approaching from the left, it's really a little bit to the left of negative 2, and that would be a bigger negative. I don't care about any directional symbols on the 4 or the 16. I care about it on my 0. And so that last factor of x plus 2 is what gave me my 0 when I subbed in negative 2. So if I'm instead going to sub in a little bit to the left of negative 2, then I'm subbing in a bigger negative. And so, if I then take a bigger negative and I add 2 to it, I will still be stuck with a negative value. Now, that's a little difficult to see, so I'm just going to go ahead and erase that to make it pretty obvious. There is my negative bit, my negative 0. My 0 negative, I should say. Okay, well then what does that mean for my denominator now? Well, when I take that positive 16, and I multiply it by that really small negative bit, that zero negative, then it's still going to give me a really small negative value on the denominator. And now I can calculate that. 
a positive divided by a negative is a negative, and 4 divided by a really small number that's always getting smaller is going to become huge and keep getting bigger. There's my infinity. Okay, now we can go to the right side of that asymptote. So, as x approaches negative 2, but from the right side. Now, are we okay if we want to start shortening up some of this notation and not having to write out that full equation again? Remember, every limit needs a function, but I can just call it f of x, like that is the name of the function. So if you want to save some time from rewriting all that out, feel free. Okay, now I'm going to look back to my blue form to make sure that I'm subbing in. So I'm subbing in so close to negative 2, I can treat it like it's negative 2. And I should get the same thing if I made my substitution correctly. But this time, I'm subbing in a little bit to the right of negative 2. So numbers a little bit to the right of negative 2 are smaller negatives. So when I look back at that factor that gave me 0, if I'm going to sub in a smaller negative for x, then when I add 2 to it, that's going to be enough to change it to a positive value. So I have a positive bit on my denominator. Okay, well now I can calculate. Well, I have my 4 over 16 times 0 is 0, but it was really a positive 16 times a positive little bit. So that denominator would still be a positive bit. And therefore, a positive divided by a positive and 4 divided by a number that's always getting smaller gives me something huge. So there is the nature of the curve for us to be able to walk our way through on a little bit more of an uglier function. Okay, what I want you to do is I want you to work your way through dealing with the nature as x approaches 2. That is, we're going to deal with the nature of the curve for our other vertical asymptote. I want you to try it on your own, and we'll see if we match up. So go ahead and pause the video now. Okay, and so we're back. So we're going to work our way through evaluating that other limit. So I'm going to address my limit as x approaches 2 from the left, 4, and I'm going to write in the equation of that function again. And there we go. Okay, I'm imagining subbing in values so close to 2, I can treat it like it's 2. So on top, I get 4. And on the denominator, I'm hoping that we can get to this pretty quick. Now I can go through and I can calculate. There is me subbing in 2 for all my x's. But now I have to remember it's not equal to 2. It's a value that's approaching 2 from the left. And so I could think of it this way. If I'm approaching 2 from the left, then that's going to make a smaller value. And so in my factor that gave me my 0, if I take a smaller value and then I subtract 2 from it, then that's going to give me a negative value. The big issue, though, is that 0 negative, that negative bit, is then squared. I hope you can see why it really didn't matter. Well, now that means that my negative bit squared is going to become a positive, and so that positive times a 4 gives me a positive bit. And so if I have a positive divided by a positive, and 4 divided by a really small number that's always getting smaller, it becomes huge. Now, you get a little extra practice with that, and perhaps we're even at that point now, where when you address the limit as x approaches 2 from the right side, very quickly, we could probably get to this. And my reason for it is let's look back at that factor. Like, the fact that I'm approaching 2 from the right side, or the fact that I'm approaching 2 from the left side, because I'm squaring, then no matter what sign of bit that I get inside that bracket, it's always going to be turned into a positive. 
And so when I evaluate that then, I can get to my zero positive pretty quickly. And we come down to infinity. So hopefully we matched up and everything went okay. And now we're going to put everything together as a sketch. And so what you'll see on the left side of the screen, there is our information about our asymptotes. So I've listed out the properties, now it's time to sketch them. So I'm going to match the colors that are given with the properties. So if I was to take that red asymptote, which is at x equals negative 2, then maybe I estimate that that is about 2 units on whatever scale I'm picturing on my x-axis. I label my asymptote as the equation of the line. And now I can put on my nature of my curve. So as I go and approach that asymptote from the left, I go to negative infinity, so I'm going down. As I approach from the right side, I am going to positive infinity, so going up. I then take a peek, and I have an other asymptote that would be at the same distance away. So I'm going to try to make that as proportional as possible because that's at x equals positive 2. I label it with the equation of the line, not just 2, but x equals 2. And as I approach that asymptote from the left side, I'm going up. And as I approach from the right side, I am going up. So that would be the information that we would be able to sketch. And there are some things that we would be able to put together. Clearly, though, without any points like intercepts, we don't really know any specifics of the curve. But, you know, we could draw some conclusion that maybe we do something like this and we loop around. Like, I don't know. Like, that looks like a little bit of a parabola section on that branch of our function. And depending on my asymptotes, or sorry, my intercepts, maybe I do something like that on one extreme and I do something like that on the other extreme. I don't know. I'm guessing and I'm just trying to use some connecting ideas to come up with the green, but that would be a partial sketch. Where we go in the future is we come up with the ability to fill in the rest of that curve. So for today, if you are able to work your way through vertical asymptotes, the idea of how to find them, and then how to examine nature of the curve using limits, to then be able to connect that to what does that mean from a graphical standpoint? What does the picture look like? That's your goal for today. If we're able to do all those things, then I think you've got a great day in Hedia. Okay, jump in, play around with some practice, maybe go back and revisit some parts of this video, make sure you're good to go. Okay, good luck.